I am Ryan Pamplin. I am one of the executives at Meta. I'm vice president of partnerships, sales, and I also cover content. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been working with all the beta developers and alpha developers who've been coming in, creating not just novelties, but truly useful things that I think will keep you coming back because there's no equivalent of usefulness. So applications that are so much more useful on the meta that you really can't go back to the old way of doing things. And the first time I'm going to ever show one of those is tomorrow uh, on stage here at VRLA, uh, the first ever holographic presentation. No keynote, no PowerPoint, all given from my FOV perspective. Is there anything you can tell us about some of those applications uh, now or uh, well, the first one is is a, a presentation tool, mm -hmm. and it's in partnership with Jigspace. They're mm -hmm. a startup who's created sort of a PowerPoint killer that, you know, instead of being sort of bound by the dimensions of a slide, uh, you get to break out of those and have all of this content that's not just flat, but is dimensional, like you and me. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot easier to communicate a lot of ideas, especially when I'm talking about use cases for augmented reality. It's a lot yeah. easier to explain with augmented reality than it is with PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. So for people, I guess, who are not familiar with the meta and, and what it accomplishes, uh, can you tell me a little bit about the headset, how it works, uh, what people can expect compared to other things they might have heard of, like the HoloLens or even VR headsets like the Vive and the sure. Oculus Rift? So the Meta One came out a couple years ago. It was the mm -hmm. first uh, augmented reality device that you could buy. Mm -hmm. uh, it was under $1,000 and got uh, a lot of fanfare, got thousands of developers really excited to create applications for AR for the first time on their heads. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge was field of view was very small, around 40-ish yeah. degrees. And, um, you know, software was immature and it was early, but mm -hmm. it was really cool for somebody like me. I mean, I've been dreaming of AR since I was yeah. seven years old when I got glasses and now <laughs> finally the technology and mm -hmm. what I've been dreaming of are finally aligned. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting is Meta got a ton of feedback from developers and early adopters saying, hey, this is really cool to see the holograms for the first time, but everything's kind of cut off on the edges. Can you fix this yeah. field of view issue? And technically the answer was no, we couldn't. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we didn't just hire the best people in Silicon Valley, we hired the best people in the world. We have 120-ish people from 19 countries. Yeah. So people from all over the world who have come to work for Meta who are really experts in their fields, many uh, experts in optics. And we actually invented a new kind of optical engine that can deliver a 4X field of view from what we had with Meta One or what you get from something like a HoloLens today. Yeah, and if you look at that in comparison to the HoloLens, you can really see the difference between where that field of view is. Totally. And you've got a lot of sensors too. So this is still a prototype. It's kind of rough uh, mm. compared to what we'll really be shipping. But uh, you've got this whole sensor array that was created uh, by Alan Beltran, who is our VP of hardware. He used to uh, help make the Google Project Tango. Mm -hmm. So a lot of expertise there. Yeah. And uh, we've got a depth camera. We've got a uh, HD camera. We've got two monos, which are industrial grade uh, very low noise, and that's used for 270 degree tracking of the environment to keep your position in the world for SLAM. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, we also have a six axis IMU in here as well, similar to what you have in your cell phone. It's kind of mm -hmm. like a gyroscope, it sort of helps understand where you are. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, when you move really quickly, you've turned your head up, yep. down, left, right, that sort of thing. Gotcha. Uh, so it's the combination of all these things, plus inside, uh, of course, some, some real uh, electronics to fuse all of those sensors into a single data stream that then goes out through a nice thin cable to right now a Windows computer later this year early next year Mac uh, mm -hmm. or whatever other devices uh, so that's interesting so why why do you guys want to support Mac because it, the general consensus has been with a lot of this stuff Apple doesn't care about graphics games or anything that you know you would probably need to hook up a headset how are you making that work? So, I mean, first of all, I think that's a misconception about mm -hmm. Apple not caring about these mm -hmm. things. Apple definitely cares. Apple, I think... Uh, well, they just dumped a bunch of money into AR. They have, yeah. They have. I mean, they made some acquisitions. And yeah. they've, you know, I'm sure they'll come up with something eventually when the market mm -hmm. matures. But I think right now, you know, when you think about applications, mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I use an iPhone. Mm -hmm. And... 
I use a MacBook Pro and I use an iPad Pro. And the app ecosystem, even if you're an Android fan, you can't argue the quality yeah. of applications that you can download through the iOS App Store, through the Mac App Store, is much higher than any other App Store. Yeah. And when you think about how many developers are developing for that platform, those are the people who think about user experience. Those are the mm -hmm. people who are best at user experience. I'm not saying that other developers aren't good at it. I'm just saying that on average, there's a higher likelihood of yeah. quality. Yeah, and there's on much more focus put on it. Exactly, so we want those developers on our platform. Mm -hmm. We don't want windows on our faces. We yeah. don't want flat panels on our faces. We need to invent a new kind of paradigm here from mm -hmm. flat devices, boxes on your desk and rectangles in your pocket to having the whole world as your desktop background. And we need really creative thinkers. We need the yeah. best UI UX people in the world to think about this and solve these problems. So we've got to be on the platforms where those people are and what they're developing for. And so how do you deal with some of the, I guess, limitations in terms of the, the GPU power available? Are there certain Macs that are sufficient for supplying? Well, that? the good news is, right, they're, they're coming out with new ones. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think a lot of us can mm -hmm. predict that there's a new MacBook Pro coming yeah. uh, with hopefully a much better graphics card inside of it or chip, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the idea that AR doesn't need the same kind of graphical capability that VR does, right? Because I'm only covering yeah. a small portion of your field of view at any given time, so mm -hmm. the rendering power is less, right? VR sort of transports me into another world, whereas AR kind of brings things into my world. Yeah. So you can build applications that uh, are very high fidelity that don't actually consume the same amount of GPU power. Uh, and there is one other solution too, which is sort of these external, you know, through Thunderbolt, you can actually mm -hmm. plug in like a 1080. Oh, that's right, yeah. Which is pretty cool. So mm -hmm. if you want to go nuts, you still can. Yeah. That's that's interesting. I, I'm 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 wondering someday, you know, we'll be plugging these into our phones. Even that's a very interesting prediction. I mean, I think that uh, I, I feel like sometimes, especially on the Apple side of thing, that the GPU in the phone is almost comparable to some of the <laughs> stuff that you get on the machines. I mean, the the recent A9X uh, chip in the iPad Pro actually beats the MacBook yeah. in a lot of benchmarks, including floating point and graphics performance, which is crazy. Yeah. Well, the CPU on the iPhone, uh, in the is it just regular A9 in the iPhone? I think so. Yeah, that's. I, I remember the single core performance. I think it was was, or maybe it's multi. One of them was beating out the new MacBook, and it's just like Apple. You got it. <laughs> Do better than that. I mean, but but that's very telling, right, of mm -hmm. where AR is going to go. Yeah, you know, I'm not I'm not going to make any announcements about you know oh, upcoming okay. products, yeah. but but I will I will comment and say that you know the future of AR mm -hmm. is clearly mobility. Yeah. It's clearly a device you wear all the time. It's that strip of glass that Marone, our CEO, mm -hmm. promised on stage at TED within five or so years. And mm -hmm. that's not just a pipe dream. That's not just a well. We hope we get there. We actually know how. It mm -hmm. can work. And things like these breakthroughs in mobile chip performance and efficiency are going to enable a device you can wear all day and have a battery that actually lasts and have processing that is good enough to produce visuals that are compelling. Mm -hmm. And you know, the best kind of AR is glasses you can put on, some kind of form factor you put on, and it disappears, right? You don't, mm -hmm. you don't even notice you're wearing it. You just become one with the content. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we're trying to design, is a natural machine that works as an extension of you as opposed to the devices today that are sucking us in and distracting us, and we have to conform to them, and they have a steep learning curve. Yeah. If we can you know, pick up an object like this mm -hmm. in AR, and it just works, that's how we innately as humans work. Mm -hmm. So if we can make the computer work that way, we kill the learning curve, we make the easiest to use computer that's ever existed in the history of of our devices yeah. or humans. Well, I mean, I think that's what is, is uh, really interesting about your approach, too, because um, you, you look at something like the HoloLens, you have this gesture and that gesture, and that's the only way you interact with it. But you guys, you're saying you're hiring the best people in the world for optics and all that stuff. But, you know, the, the, I, from the TED Talk and everything, I've always read neurology plays a very important role in to how you're handling this and how people think and how they interact and you know when you see the meta demos you see people using their hands um, so how did you make that work how do you make that natural and have this understand and people be able to put this on it is intuitive and they can just go 
Neuroscience is a, a fundamental principle of meta. Mm. And Merlin likes to say we have the largest neuroscience team per capita in Silicon yeah. Valley. And it's probably true. Mm -hmm. um, we have really brilliant people we've poached from academia who mm -hmm. are world leading experts in the topic. Mm -hmm. And what they do all day, every day is come up with human interactions and they test them. And we write software to test those. And we figure out, you know, if someone wants to reach out and grab something, what's the most natural way? Is it this? Is it this? It's not that. Yeah. Uh, you know, what is it? And, and then we make that part of our, you know, SDK and part of, more importantly, our neuro interface design principles, our mm -hmm. guidelines. And then we evangelize those to the world because we want uh, the developers that are building, especially on our platform, to make sure that they're following those principles because they're not just made up, right? They're mm -hmm. not just like, ah, oh, here, this is fun. Some UX guy figured this out. No, this is stuff we've tested and we've proven it to be true. And we want the developers to use these interactions because we know that it will be a more uh, joyous experience and a simpler experience and one that doesn't hurt the brain and cause frustration and one that people don't have to read directions to use. Mm -hmm. And you know what? If Microsoft and Magic Leap copy those things, the world will be a better place because of it. Yeah, and it, it, it's, uh, it seems like Microsoft is actually trying to do much more hand tracking and figure that out and have more uh, useful interactions in it because teaching someone to do an air tap on there, it's, it's a weird learning curve for something that is such a simple motion, but it's because people don't understand when their fingers are disappearing and what that means. Yeah, when they're occluded. Yeah. yeah. So I, I guess um, in... in terms of putting this all together, the it, it's got to be relatively complicated to design software around these things and, and get people to understand how to develop in those circumstances. I'm curious, one, how, uh, how, how developers learn how to develop in this new way, and also how you keep people grounded when they're using the device, because you know, when you're shoving something on a monitor and it's a, a rectangle and everything's contained, you kind of have some sort of home base, even with a smartphone, um, you know, you have your home screen, everything kind of comes back to that one place and you're moving around and then going back to home. Where, where is home in the meta? Mm -hmm. So there's a meta operating environment, okay. which we're building, which eventually will be an operating system of its own. Mm -hmm. uh, today it's a GUI that runs on top of a host operating system like Windows or later Mac. Mm -hmm. And certainly it could be a phone or whatever other device you know it's developed for, ported to in the future, assuming it's got you know powerful enough chips. Yep. Uh, which there are things coming to the market right now that do. So mm -hmm. it's very interesting. Uh, in terms of you know where's home, we haven't exactly announced and shown yet mm -hmm. uh, how the operating environment looks and works. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to spoil any secrets. Okay. But uh, it's cool. It's cool. It's unlike anything else you've ever seen. Of course, it's volumetric. It's spatial. It's mm -hmm. not a menu. It's not a start menu. It's not a you know. It doesn't work like this. Yeah. Um, you know it. There, even the idea of an icon is different. You mm -hmm. know, instead of an icon, you have sort of a mini representation of the application, and you sort of grab it and then put it where you want it to go, and that's how you sort of start an application. Uh, so it sounds different, but it's much closer to real life than it is to any other computer that's ever existed. And, and I think that's, I mean, you, even in the HoloLens, you see some of that, and they obviously have the start menu and a more traditional computing environment, but I think one of the most compelling things, especially in, in the work department, which I'm sure you guys are moving farther along on that uh, than anyone else right now, because everything else seems to be more on the game side of things but you know you're not you know, people talk about productivity with multiple monitors well there is no monitor you just throw the screen or whatever you're working on in, in a specific location and that's a really compelling thing because suddenly you know computers are just something you 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 throw that digital information wherever it is convenient and useful to you yeah i mean we have something right now which I don't know if anybody's really reported on too much, but I'll tell you, probably not supposed to tell you, but I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> uh, we have the ability now to you know, take, let's say, Excel or PowerPoint mm -hmm. or Word or whatever productivity application you want, you know, take it out of your monitor and put it here. And if you want it bigger, make it bigger. If you want it smaller, smaller, you know, tilt it towards you, whatever you want. And you can use your hand on it or you could use the mouse and the keyboard. Still prototype form but it works, it's functional, and 
you know, you're going to hear some announcements around this uh, in the near future with some pretty big names in terms of people who plan to use this. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, there's sort of a bridge uh, on the way to AR making your laptop and your tablet and your TV obsolete. That's mm -hmm. going to happen. Mm -hmm. But on the way there, there's sort of this ability to extend these existing systems and devices that you know and love and that you need to use. You're not going to abandon your productivity tools overnight. Yeah. You will eventually, but not until the new ones are better mm -hmm. and you can't go back to the old way. And I think maybe for presenting we can do that quicker than mm -hmm. for word processing. Yeah. But it'll all get there eventually and right now, you know, we want to help you use the applications you know and love. And we also, of course, want to provide those new experiences as well that are going to break out of, you know, not just the dimensional limitations of the screen size, I think more importantly, the 2D limitation, going from 2D mm -hmm. to 3D. And to answer your other question in terms of how do you get developers to understand this stuff, yeah. um, we've had to learn. We've had to figure that out. So we've been bringing developers in, uh, alpha developers, beta developers. We're now at the beta stage. Mm -hmm. And you know, in the beginning, we were sitting down with literally our CEO, uh, our lead neuroscientist, and our head of UX. Mm -hmm. And you know, the three of them would spend about two hours with the developers talking through you know, the 10 guiding principles of neurointerface design. And we recorded videos of that, and we distilled it down, distilled it down, distilled it down, interviewed the developers afterwards, and found out what was actually practical. You know, what's, what's just hype? What just sounds good mm -hmm. versus what is actually useful to you? And what we figured out is that all 10 of them are actually useful to people in their current form. And we sort of refined those to make them very actionable. And I think the best thing that we did is we built examples for the developers to look at. Yeah. Uh, and now you've got people coming in and they're going, what do you mean no menus and buttons, right? Because <laughs> that's what we're saying is we want to yeah. kill menus and we want to kill buttons. Or is it going to happen overnight? Maybe. You know, it might take a little bit for certain, certain use cases. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, um, they're buying into it. And, and you know, it's working. And the applications that I'm using on the device now are respecting these guidelines. And, you know, I, even I was skeptical, you know, in the early days where it's like, yeah. wait, what do you mean we're going to do this all with neuroscience? How, you know? Yeah. And well, it's, it's, it's been a journey. We haven't used it. Yeah. If, if it's like, if it's brand new, it kind of feels like, well, no, this works. Why are we getting away from that? But this is a very different experience. Yeah. And it's really cool now that the devs are, are adopting, right? And yeah. the devs, their feedback, we do these feedback sessions after every alpha, or every beta, and we get the whole company gathered around, and the devs kind of talk to, you know, 100 plus people about their experience, mm -hmm. and they're, they're brutal, you know, they're yeah. honest. And that's important. Totally, and there were things missing in the early days in alpha, mm -hmm. it's alpha, right? You yeah. Know? So like, no examples, things like that. Mm -hmm. So developers are like, hey, give me some examples, please. So now, you know, even, even back then and, and now, what you hear always though is, man, those principles, you know, there's something about those that mm -hmm. really sets you guys apart and is really special. Yeah, I, I was thinking that right now, that it's interesting, you talk to anyone else that's doing this stuff, you'll hear about how we're exploring, we're figuring it out. And it's really, I think, kind of a romantic idea to do that. And even with Microsoft, they're so engaged with the developers and the community and trying to help have people figure things out and whatnot. But there aren't very many guidelines. There isn't much that they, they've put out so little in that regard. And I don't think I've seen anyone else that is doing this sort of stuff who, is, who, who says, oh, yeah, no, this is how it should work. We have some ideas of how this actually works well for people, and you're exploring that in a, in a, in a way that doesn't seem like anyone else is. If you nail these things, you drive adoption. You mm -hmm. know, if I'm an aircraft manufacturer and something normally takes me eight hours to do, and I can cut it down to four hours because you've built an application that has these principles that make it easier, faster, more accurate, you just saved me four metas in four hours. Yeah. So. With all of this uh, happening, what do, you, what do you think the future of work is going to be like in, you know, using headsets like this? I think that uh, we're going to have to redesign the office space yeah. because the desk becomes somewhat obsolete. Mm -hmm. um, Which is good because you know, we don't need to be sitting down so much. Yeah, desks are bad for us. Yeah. Uh, I think you know, when it's tethered, it's mm -hmm. a little different than when it goes yeah. completely portable. But you know, right now, there's a lot of great, truly useful experiences you can have at your desk or plugged into your laptop, which could be portable, or even one of those VR backpacks, which we've yeah. been playing with, which, boy, oh boy, that's fun, because then you have yeah. a truly portable AR with giant field of view, and it's really fun. I'm surprised we haven't seen more of those yet. 
you will. We have. Yeah. Maybe maybe we have some around our office, but you know, a lot of them are still like not unveiled to the public yet. So, mm-hmm. um, I mean, I know because I get to play with this stuff, and you know, people that build the stuff come to us and they let us try it. Yeah. Um, and it's it's pretty awesome. I mean, you've got like five pound custom machines that are not like, you know, a case that you put off the shelf components in. Like things yeah. are soldered onto the boards. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you've got these very compact devices with the latest and greatest GPUs and CPUs with, you know, terrible battery life, but, yeah. but you know, hot swappable batteries. So, you know, you could do an hour or two at a time. Mm-hmm. And uh, those are going to just open up a world of possibilities. And that's going to drive mobility, right? Because you're going to start to see really useful applications mm-hmm. that are so good that people are willing to put up with the cumbersome nature of a backpack. Yeah. And then that is ultimately going to, you know, drive home a really strong case for, mm-hmm. you know, making these things portable faster yeah. with and- the kind of fidelity that you can get. I mean, we can run, you know, seven and a half million polygon models you know in this thing because it's as good as whatever compute you plug it into whereas you know with the hololens mm-hmm. they've had to put in much lower horsepower hardware so maybe mm-hmm. you're going to get fifteen thousand polygons mm-hmm. and, and it's interesting too because um with the with the backpacks and it's i think this is the same thing with hololens too you have a limited battery life the hololens is three hours you're saying one to two with the backpack but yeah. you can swap well, it depends the, on the backpack right but so. In a lot of ways, because of the way the hardware is with the headsets, you might not want to wear it that long anyway. In general, for the future of work, we'll have to have our offices mm-hmm. reconfigured, right? We're probably mm-hmm. not going to necessarily be bound to our desks entirely. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, you know, what's going to happen is the, the monitors are going to disappear. Mm-hmm. The Ultimately, the computer towers are going to disappear. The laptops are going to disappear. The tablets are going to disappear. Mm-hmm. And the applications are not going to be bound to these tiny little dimensions relative to our fields of view. Mm-hmm. So, you know, data visualization is going to get really rich. Yeah. Collaboration is going to get crazy because I'm going to see what you're seeing. You're going to see what I'm seeing. We're going to be able to touch it directly with our hands. And ideally, the technology is going to disappear. You're not even going to realize you're wearing AR. You're going to forget about it, just like yeah. I'm forgetting that I'm wearing glasses right now. Mm-hmm. And you know, you're just going to touch these things directly and you're going to become one with that content. So I think what we're going to see is a big boost to productivity. I think we're going to see a big boost to efficiency, to accuracy, mm-hmm. and to creativity as well. Because you sort of open the mind when you can take you know, a pen and mm-hmm. you can just draw anywhere around me. I don't have to draw on a flat whiteboard here. Mm-hmm. You and I, you know, if you say, hey, show me what the strip of glass is going to look like, I can draw it right here in front of you and you see yeah. it and I see it and it's like, yeah, and then we can grab it and move it and touch it. Mm-hmm. You know, that I think is uh, just going to allow people to unleash their potential in ways they haven't been able to previously. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I'm excited about it. Yeah, me too. <laughs>